Okay. So w welcome to an ISERM public lecture. Uh, I'm uh, Jill Pfeiffer. I'm the director of the Institute for Computational and Experimental Research in Mathematics. ISERM is a National Science Foundation funded mathematics institute at Brown University. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker tonight, uh, Jordan Ellenberg, the John D. MacArthur Professor of Mathematics at the University of Wisconsin. Professor Ellenberg is well known in mathematics for his research in algebraic geometry and number theory, and especially for the surprising uh, discoveries he's made that connect algebraic and geometric structures. But he's also very well known for, uh, for his contributions to the public education in mathematics. He's got a PhD in mathematics from Harvard, but also a master's degree in fiction writing from Johns Hopkins. And he is, uh, <clears throat> in addition to his research of awards of a, of a Sloan Foundation Fellowship, an NSF career grant, he is a 2013 Fellow of the American Mathematical Society and a 2015 Guggenheim Fellow. So uh, Jordan's writings has, have appeared in um, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wired, The Believer, the Boston Globe, and he's the author of Do the Math on Slate, if you have read that. Uh, finally, I have to mention Jordan Ellenberg's uh, book, uh, <clears throat> How Not to Be Wrong. It's a wonderful, insightful guide to navigating the mathematics of everyday life. I loved this book, and I sent a few copies to friends after I read it. Now the list of, of people that I'd like to send it to not all friends, are, is quite long. So, um, the, but tonight we're gonna hear about uh, one of the topics that you'll find in, in this book, if you have the good fortune to read it, lottery schemes and their connection to mathematics. So please join me in welcoming Jordan Ellenberg. Hi everybody, thanks so much for coming out on a rainy night. Um, well, so I mean, as a teacher of mathematics, I mean, the way we teach math is by telling stories. So basically, tonight is just going to be devoted uh, to a story, a math story. And I guess maybe, um, what, is, what did I learn from getting a degree in fiction writing? It's good to start stories at the end. So, so let's start at the end. I actually have a movie. Let's see if it will play. Um, so what you're looking at... Good evening, this is Jamie. Welcome to the Mass State Lottery's lottery Cash lottery Windfall drawing. drawing for Monday, January 23rd, 2012 on MassLottery.com. Tonight's jackpot is estimated at $2 million. Now let's see how you this did tonight's drawing. It's very unfamiliar in Wisconsin, let me tell you. Um, so what you're watching First is the drawing is for the Massachusetts Cash Windfall Lottery. It's a drawing for January 2012. Um, and, then and this is actually the last ever drawing of the Massachusetts Next Cash Windfall Lottery which is why it's the end of the story. And, and the point six. of the story is really to explain why this was the last ever drawing of this 17. lottery. So I'll Once stop again, the winning cash windfall numbers for So before we start, let me remind you guys, or tell you for the first time, a little bit about how a lottery works. So here's the basic idea. A lottery ticket costs a small amount of money, and what you get for your small amount of money is a small chance of winning a large amount of money. That's the basic idea. So for instance, I'll make sort of a baby version here. Maybe a ticket costs $2, and maybe each ticket offers you a 1 in 200 chance of winning $300. So if you were to buy a lot of lottery tickets, and people who play the lottery do buy a lot of lottery tickets, if you were to buy, let's say, 1,000 tickets, well, out of those 1,000 times, you'll probably win about five times. right? I mean, it could be more, it could be less. It's a game of chance. But on average, you can expect to win about five times, each one of those times getting $300. Um, and so in the end, you'll come away with $1,500, um, about $1.50 per ticket, which sounds pretty good, winning $1,500, until you remember that you've actually spent $2,000 in order to win your $1,500. So that's an important feature of the lottery. 
Um, the way we usually, in mathematics, the way we usually analyze games of chance of this kind is via the mathematical terminology of expected value. So here we would say that the expected value of that ticket is $1.50. But I want to sort of stop here and, in some sense, apologize on behalf of our profession because this is one of those terms that I think, if we could, we would go back in time and change. Because whatever the expected value is, it is certainly not the value you expect the ticket to have. That's what the notation would suggest, but that is just wrong. I mean, the ticket is either worth $0.00, or it's worth $300, but whatever it's worth, it's certainly not worth $1.50. So in some sense, maybe a, a better name that more accurately uh, reflects what expected value means is sort of the average value. If you had a bunch of these tickets, how much would you expect them to be worth on average? Um, but in any event, the way we use expected value when analyzing bets in games of chance like this, or more generally, any kind of decision that we need to make under conditions of uncertainty is, um, we try not to pay more for something than its expected value. So we try not to pay $2 for something whose expected value is $1.50. Um, because when we do so, in the long run, on average, we're going to lose money. So now you know the basics, Lottery 101. Um, I said this was kind of a baby example. Uh, it's unrealistic of real lotteries in many ways. And maybe the most important way is that this lottery example I gave is actually much, much, much more generous to the player than any real lottery would ever be. A dollar fifty expected value on a two dollar ticket would be great. Here's what a real lottery looks like. It looks more something more like this. Um, so what you're looking at is the payoffs for the Massachusetts State Lottery uh, in early 2005. Um, Another difference between the, this and the lottery, the sort of baby edition of the lottery I just showed you is that in a real lottery, there are usually many different prizes. There's a jackpot for getting all the numbers correct. That was very unlikely. In this game, there was uh, six numbers chosen out of the balls that you saw in the cage, um, each one of which could be one of 48 choices. So the chance of hitting the jackpot was almost one in 10 million, pretty bad. The prize for that, on the other hand, was pretty good. I mean, it varied depending on how much money was in the pool. Um, but you could get smaller prizes for matching fewer of the numbers, all the way down to just matching two out of the six, which is not so unlikely. I mean, that's going to happen you know, a little more than one in seven times. Well, th this was clever. You didn't get money. You just got another ticket so you could keep playing. <laughs> um, so for the, for the sticklers, you can sort of correct my computation there to make it a little bit recursive because you get a free ticket and you don't really get your $2 back. Anyway, the, but the point is that the, val the expected value of this $2 ticket is a mere 80 cents, so much worse than $1.50. And this is more typical of real state lotteries. If you sort of go through and pick your favorite game and compute its expected value, you get, you'll get something closer to this. So this was the Massachusetts State Lottery. And it was not going well. Massachusetts had a problem. The problem was that nobody won the jackpot for about a year, and people were starting to get demoralized. I mean, running a lottery is sort of partly a matter of mathematics and partly a matter of psychology and marketing. Um, nobody won the jackpot for a long time. Money was piling up at the jackpot pool, and people were not playing, and Massachusetts knew that it needed to change something. So what did they do? They introduced a new rule. It was, uh, it was borrowed from a game that had recently closed in Michigan called Michigan Windfall. So this new game called Cash Windfall had a rule called the roll down rule. What did this mean? It meant that instead of letting that money pile up and pile up and pile up in the jackpot as nobody won and nobody won and nobody won, no, we're not going to let that happen. Instead, once the jackpot goes above a certain threshold, which is set at $2 million in this case, once it went above $2 million, if nobody won in the next drawing, all that money in the jackpot pool rolled down to enrich the lower tier prizes. So instead of being $4,000 for matching five, it would be much more. Instead of being $150 for matching four, it would be much more. So the point of this rule change was to make the game more exciting, to make people feel like they had a chance of really winning something, to make the game seem like a better deal for the players. And they succeeded. Um, in some sense, they succeeded a little bit too well. <laughs> um, this is what the payoff matrix for the Massachusetts Cash Windfall Lottery looked like uh, in February 2005. 
I always, it's the greatest joy of my life to be able to get a laugh with a table, by the way. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so in their attempt to make a game that seemed like a good deal for the players, they had done the one thing you really shouldn't do if you run the lottery, which is make a, a game which was actually a good deal for the players. <laughs> So on this particular day, the, the 7th of February, 2005, the expected value of that $2 ticket was $5.53. That's quite amazing and quite generous to the players. So, so how do I know the exact payoffs for this particular, why do I know it for this particular day in 2005? The reason I know it is because I read about it in the following document, which I'll sort of show you an image of. Um, you're not supposed to be able to read this from here, but let me just tell you, uh, what you are looking at is, a, is the first page of a 25-page report uh, written by the Inspector General of the State of Massachusetts and sent to the Treasurer uh, trying to explain just what had happened to their lottery, <laughs> which is the subject of a long and complicated investigation. Um, it's kind of ama an amazing story. I'm sorry to have to tell you guys a truncated version of it. Tonight, I'll, I'll just say that this report, I have to say, is definitely the only municipal fiscal oversight document you will ever read that makes you wonder if somebody has the movie rights to it. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of twists and turns, but um, let me give you the short version. Um, it's that um, the, sh the short version is that very quickly after this new rule was introduced, the lottery started to notice large ticket purchases concentrated in certain places, concentrated um, in, a, in a star market in Central Square in Cambridge. Um, <laughs> there, was an, there was another one down in, a, in Quincy, um, and there was another set of huge purchases up in uh, Williamstown, Massachusetts. Um, what, was, what was going on? What was going on is that there are very, lots of people who can make a table like the one I just showed you. And in particular, um, there was a student at MIT who had the incredible good luck in January 2005 to be doing an independent study project on the expected values of state lottery games. <laughs> um, just at the right time. So as part of his project, he was working out the expected value of every game currently being run by uh, by Massachusetts, and he made a table probably pretty much like the one I just showed you. And what you can imagine, the first thing that he did, uh, he, went around, uh, he went around his dorm and he basically told everybody he could find, you should really give me as much cash as you have right now <laughs> so I can go to the star market in Central Square and buy as many lottery tickets uh, as I can afford. And like, you know, lots of kids at MIT can make or check a table like this, and so he was able to get a lot of takers. Um, and so um, he formed a group of people uh, called, they eventually actually licensed themselves as a company called Random Strategies um, <laughs> to buy lots of lottery tickets every time this roll down rule was in effect. By the way, I should say, the strategy probably doesn't seem that random. <laughs> um, in fact, MIT being MIT, uh, the name of their dorm was Random Hall. That's where they all, that's where they all lived. And that's the, so, that, so in the end, actually, there were three big groups of people who started buying really large numbers of tickets uh, for this game. One of them was this group of students at MIT. Um, another was led by a guy called um, Jerry Selby, uh, who was a retired engineer in Michigan. Now, here's your listening comprehension. Who remembers why I mentioned Michigan once before in this talk? <laughs> OK, the kid. Exactly. So Jerry Selby was a guy who had been making a lot of bank for the last five years playing this game, playing Michigan Windfall, <laughs> before it finally closed down in 2004. And he absolutely could not believe his eyes when he saw that Massachusetts had opened the same game. So he and his wife immediately got in their car and drove to the nearest point in Massachusetts to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he was from, which is in Williamstown. Um, and they set up their buys. And then there was another whole group. Actually, they had my favorite name, the Dr. Zhang Lottery Club, um, which is run by Ying Zhang, who is a biomedical engineer at, um, at Northeastern. And they were buying tickets in, down in Quincy. 
um, every time that roll down came up. So by the time these three betting cartels were in full swing, um, about 80 to 90% of all tickets bought by anyone <laughs> for the roll down games were being bought by a member of one of these three groups. So they had essentially taken over the lottery for themselves. By the way, I should say, um, the expected value did go down because with so many tickets being bought, there was more prize splitting. But they were still making a return of about 15%, um, which is pretty good. So how does the story end? I sort of showed you one version of the ending. But um, this comes to a stop when uh, sometime in the summer of 2011, uh, this is the front page of the Boston Globe. So, so a reporter from the Boston Globe gets wise to what's been going on and runs a story sort of explaining uh, what has happened with the cash windfall. And remember what I said, that running a lottery has a lot to do with psychology. Once everybody knew that this was going on, people stopped playing and the lottery started to dwindle and it sort of limped to a halt with that last drawing I showed you being about six months after uh, this Boston Globe story comes out. Um, so that's sort of the narrative part of the story, right? I mean, I, there's a lot of twists and turns I didn't tell you about, but um, this is a math talk, not just a storytelling talk. And so what I want to turn to now is that I think this story, when you read it as a mathematician, there's a lot of puzzles that are left. And actually, I got kind of obsessed with these puzzles as I read the story and tried to figure out what was going on and read the Inspector General's report. Um, so let's talk about those and sort of figure them out. There's an easy puzzle and a hard one, and I'm going to start with the easy one. Um, so the first puzzle is that it's actually really hard to figure out how you would get away with this. I mean, let me remind you that the state of Massachusetts knows who wins the lottery, right? It's not a secret. They have to pay you. <laughs> they know that it's like the same stores every single time, like winning all the prizes. Um, so it is extremely difficult to figure out um, how you get away with something like this. So I said this puzzle was easy. Uh, Here's the, here's the answer. The answer is that the state of Massachusetts completely knew what was going on the entire time. The entire, I mean, remember, this is six years. That first drawing I showed you is, 20, is 2015, and then it ends at the very beginning of 2012. So this is going on for a long time. Um, one thing I did not tell you, just to create a little dramatic tension, um, I, I slightly lied. It's not true that the first thing the MIT students did was go around their dorm collecting lots of money. Um, the first thing they did, actually, as we know this from the Inspector General's report, the first thing they did was get on the tee and go out to the lottery headquarters in Braintree and meet with lottery officials and say, like, you know, this new game you have has a massively positive expected value. We're kind of planning to, like, buy thousands of tickets and make lots of money. Is that legal? See, these are good, like, rule-abiding kids. I see some brown undergrads in the room, right? That's what you would do. You would, like, um, And the Inspector General's report does not record exactly what response they got from the lottery officials, but apparently it was, knock yourself out. Because that was what they did for the next six years. So, OK, that's the answer to this question. Um, but this leads to sort of a sub-puzzle, which is, why did the state <laughs> allow this to take place? Why did the state allow random strategies to win $3.5 million uh, over the course of these five years? Um, and to answer this question, I want to remind you again of a little feature of how the lottery works. So that $2 that the state takes in, right? You buy your ticket, $2 goes in. Um, 80 cents of that, 40%, the state is going to keep for revenue. This is set by statute, by the way. The state is going to keep that 80 cents and use it you know, to do the things that lotteries do, right? Like pave the streets, pay school teachers, keep the lights on, et cetera, et cetera. And the rest is eventually going to go out in prizes, whether it's immediately or piling into the jackpot pool. But the value proposition for the state is extremely simple. For each ticket that's sold, they get 80 cents. What that means is that the state does not care who wins. The state only cares about how many tickets are sold. And these guys bought a lot of tickets. 
So, you know, when this story, when, was, when this expose ran in the Globe, it was very much presented as these guys found a way to scam the state out of millions of dollars. But actually, the state came out millions of dollars ahead of where it would have had these guys never existed. So they really had no incentive to stop this from taking place. They were quite happy to take in the extra money. So maybe I'll show you an extremely sophisticated diagram at the limit of my PowerPoint skills. <laughs> um, you should think of it like this. Um, random strategies were not taking money from Massachusetts. They were taking money from all the people who were playing the lottery on non-roll down days. That's where it was coming from. And with every transaction, all the money that moves along that blue arrow from the regular players to the members of this betting cartel, Massachusetts gets 80 cents each time. I mean, one way of thinking it like this, I mean, I think, again, the way this was presented in the newspapers at the time was that uh, these MIT students had found a way to beat the house. So I think that's wrong. Let me explain. What these guys were doing were making many, 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 many bets. They were buying about 200,000 tickets at a time, by the way, by the, end of, by the end of this. Each cartel was. So making many, many, many bets, each one of which had a small positive expected value tilted in their favor. So they, you know, they might win some and they may lose some, but overall, they were going to come out ahead in the long run because each bet was tilted slightly in their favor. If that's what you are doing, you are not beating the house. You are the house. <laughs> I, I mean, that is exactly what the house does. Um, so I think a good way to think about what actually happened in Massachusetts from the years 2005 to 2012 is that it was very analogous to a, a gambling situation you're quite used to, which is what happens in Nevada. I mean, Random Strategies is playing the role of the casino, the regular players are playing the role of the regular players, and the state, well, is playing the role of the state. <laughs> so Massachusetts had essentially licensed a gigantic, underpublicized virtual casino <laughs> for people to play in, um, and they had no more incentive to shut this down than Nevada has to shut down Las Vegas. That would make no sense, because it benefits the state to do it. Because states, when it comes down to it, do not like to gamble. States like to collect taxes. That's what they're good at. <laughs> OK, so that answers the first question, I think, in a fairly satisfactory way. Um, now, now let me turn to the, to the harder of the two puzzles. So I've sort of talked about this as if all three of these betting cartels were doing the same thing. But there's one very interesting way in which that was not true, which I read about in this Inspector General's report. Um, Jerry Selby and the Dr. John Lottery Club, when they bought their tickets, um, they used what's called the quick pick. Do you guys know what that is, the quick pick machine? OK, a few yeses, a lot of liars. OK. It's, um, <laughs> the quick pick machine is the machine that will just give you, will just, it's a, just a machine that will print out tickets with random numbers for you. If you don't care which numbers you have, I mean, some people you know, like to play their birthday, or they like to play their kid's birthday, or like the number that came in their fortune cookie, or whatever. Don't do that, by the way, because you'll split the prize with a lot of other people if you use the fortune cookie number. Um, anyway, some people like to pick their numbers, but most people don't care. Um, and we'll just use the quick pick machine to pick out random numbers for them. And I think the discussion we've had so far sort of endorses that view. Each ticket has the same expected value. The numbers are chosen out of the cage completely randomly. So in some sense, it doesn't matter very much. Uh, which tickets you have. Um, and if you're buying 200,000 tickets, you can especially see why you would want to use the quick pick machine. <laughs> but random strategies did not do this. Random strategies filled out 200,000 lottery tickets by hand. That is weird. <laughs> and the Inspector General notes this, um, but doesn't explain why. And I became obsessed with this question. I want to try to explain why. By the way, maybe. Before I go into it, I have to say as a side note, it sounds kind of cool to like figure out a way to beat the lottery and make all this money. But I do want to point out that when you actually read about their process, it actually sounds like sort of a pain. I mean, first of all, they filled out 200,000 lottery tickets by hand. Extremely tedious. Um, second of all, did you know that if your income source is making money from winning lottery tickets, you have to fill out a tax form for each prize. 
if you win the jackpot, that's okay. <laughs> but if your business model, as it was for these guys, is winning like thousands upon thousands of these smaller four out of six prizes, this is yet again another huge piece of tedious work. And by the way, um, in case you get audited, and if your major income is from thousands upon thousands of lottery prizes, you do get audited. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, when you report, you're balancing your winnings against your losses. So you have to keep all the losing tickets in order to be able to prove your losses. So Jerry Selby, actually, I, I talked to him about this on the phone, he actually had to build a barn outside his house <laughs> to hold his five years of losing Michigan lottery tickets, to which he then had to add his um, many years of losing. Um, so it sounds super cool to win all this money, but this was a split among a group of about 10 people at MIT, and if you stop and think like, huh, I wonder what they would have made in salary, like 10 MIT graduates, if for, if for like six years they had just gotten, gone and gotten a job. <laughs> <laughs> Something to think about. Um, anyway, let's talk about math. So, um, so why, why would they do, on top of all the tedium I already told you about, why would they take on the tedious task of filling out all these tickets by hand? So okay, when, as mathematicians, when we are faced with a problem that we don't understand, we always try to make it simpler. We always try to replace it with a simpler problem that we can sort of hold in our head, which hopefully has enough of the flavor of the original that it'll help us understand the thing we're actually trying to understand. So with that in mind, um, let's think about a smaller lottery, which for some reason I don't know is often in the literature called the Transylvanian lottery. Um, and in this lottery, you're not drawing six balls out of each one of which is numbered one through 48. That's too complicated. Um, you're drawing three balls, each one of which is numbered one through seven, right? So there's seven balls in the cage, and you're going to pull three of them. And the advantage of this is that the number of possibilities for the jackpot is so small that I can fit them all on one slide. And here they are. I hope you can be convinced that I've like, written all the possibilities of ways to draw three numbers out of seven. Um, for the combinatorics fans, that is seven choose three, or 35. That's how many, uh, that's how many triples there are on here. Okay, so. I'm designing my lottery that I'm telling you about. I have to tell you what the, how many balls there are and how many numbers there are. I've told you that. Now I have to tell you what the prizes are. And to make this realistic, we should have multiple tiers of prizes. So, um, so let's say this. If you get all three numbers right, you hit the jackpot, you win $6. If you get two out of three, that's still pretty good, you get $2. Otherwise, you get nothing. So for instance, if the jackpot is 137, if that's what you have, you get $6. Great. If you have, let's say, 127, you have the one and the seven, right? Order doesn't matter, by the way. Um, so you get $2. And if you have one, four, five, or anything else that matches one or zero numbers of the jackpot, um, then you get zero. So a big player in this game is not somebody who buys 200,000 tickets, right? There's only 35 possible tickets, after all. So let's say a big player in this game is somebody who buys, let's say, seven tickets. Well, that's a lot. That's like a fifth of like, all the possible tickets. Um, so I made a little chart so you can see um, if you buy seven random tickets, what are your winnings going to look like? It's not hard to, to compute that the expected value of those seven tickets is $6. But of course, you know, different things might happen. You might get unlucky and completely strike out. That's actually not very likely. There's only a 4% chance that all seven of your tickets will be complete losers, but it certainly could happen. Um, and maybe not surprisingly, you see this distribution is kind of like humped around six. Six is actually not quite the mode. It's like very slightly more likely that you'll get four than six. But um, there's some distribution of things that might happen. Um, so what I want to do, because I think we have time to do it, um, and we can sort of uh, take a break from just listening to me talk, is um, let's actually play this game. I have a question. How many of you guys have in your possession like a piece of paper, or some of you guys have laptops I see and can like type something in. Is there like enough of people to be able to do it? Okay, here's what we're gonna do, ready? Everybody in the room who wants to is gonna be a big player in the game, but you are gonna choose your seven tickets that you want, okay? And you can pick them at random or you can pick them according to some scheme of your own, but I want you to write down, I'll, I'll, I'll show you all the, let me flip back and show you all the options. Um, so choose seven of these. I mean, you can, I mean, 
But before you choose, let me tell you what the rules are going to be, OK? This is going to be an elimination game, kind of like, um, like a dance-off. Basically, we're going to choose a jackpot at random. And then anybody who wins less than $6 is going to be eliminated. OK? So your goal, you want to avoid, uh, you want to avoid losses. So anybody who gets less than $6 is going to be eliminated. And then we're going to keep on doing it and see who's left. So I'm going to actually give you guys a minute, those of you who, so I only ask about the paper because I at least cannot remember like seven strings or three digits in my head. So maybe if you guys have better memories than me, you don't need to use paper. But um, that's what I would recommend. And I'll give you guys a minute to, to choose, and then we'll play. And I'm also going to need one person to be the ball cage, actually. So I don't actually have like a physical metal cage full of ping pong balls. So um, who's going to do it? Mike, can you do it? Can you? I'm volunteering you to choose random numbers for me. Will you do it? Oh, oh no, but I was saying, well, oh, are you playing? I want somebody who's not playing to be my. Random number generator. I'll, uh, I'll not play and I'll just do it. Okay, Jamie's going to do it. Okay. All right, does everybody have their numbers? Are we ready to go? Oh, no? I'm not going anywhere. I can get. Um. Okay. I'm playing two, by the way. I'm going to show you my numbers. Okay. Oh my god, I think Jamie is actually coding a random number generator like as we do this. That is, that is awesome. Um, or you can just pretend that you're coding it and then like yell out numbers and pretend that you like just wrote it that fast. Um, OK. All right, we're going to do this. All right. Um, so let's put up my numbers. You can see I'm being honest. Um, OK, here's my, here's, my, here's my numbers that I chose. And you've all got your numbers that you chose. Um, Okay, Jamie, can I have a can I have a jackpot? Um, uh, one seven. Uh, oh, the suspense. <laughs> one seven three. One seven three. Okay, let's see. First, I gotta look and see if I have the jackpot. I don't have it. So you're adding a number. You're adding how much money you win. Six for a jackpot, two for a deuce. Okay, so one three seven. I do not have a jackpot on there, but I there's my one two three. I've got two there, so that's a deuce. One, six, seven. I've got another one. And three, five, seven. I think that's it. OK, so I won six, so I'm barely in. Everybody, count, everybody compute your score and see how much. And see, well, remember, the jackpot is 137. How much do you get for a deuce? $2 for a deuce. That's why it's called that. How would that happen? Because I think each ticket you have is either going to be. Um, Six dollars for the ja is the jackpot. So if you get the jackpot, you're automatically still in, um, and you don't even have to compute the rest. Okay, who's still in? A lot of people. Awesome. Okay. By the way, just to show this again, um, I mean, note that even if you pick your tickets randomly, the chance of getting $6 or more is pretty good. So it's not, I mean, you should still be proud of yourself, I'm just saying. OK. <laughs> All right, let's do it again. Jamie, I need more numbers. And oh, by the way, and remember, this is like the dance off. Once you're out, you're out. You can still play, but only recreationally. OK, so, <laughs> so just remember that you're out. OK. Uh, yes, Jamie, what do we got? 214. OK, 214 or 124. Remember, order does not matter. I'm going to look for my. <laughs> I do not have a jackpot, but I've got a deuce at one, two, three, and I've got another deuce at one, four, five, so I've already got four bucks in my first two. And then um, two, four, seven, and then I'm done. Okay, so I, so I have six again. Okay, everybody's computing.
OK, one, two, four. OK, now who's still in? OK, but fewer people, right? Everybody agree? Noticeably fewer? OK, let's do it again. We're not going to actually get down to one, you guys. I'm sorry. That would actually, um, given that there's only, well, OK. That would take too long. But we'll, we'll, we'll see it thin out. OK, Jimmy, give me another one. Two, five, seven. OK, let's see what we got. Um, let's see. Oh, two, four, seven. I've got a deuce. Two, five, six. And then three, five, seven. I'm saved by the last one. OK. So I'm in with six. OK, who's still in now? Yeah, getting this. Should we do one more? What do you think? Okay, one last one. Let's do one more. We already did that. <laughs> okay, but that's effective. Okay, do another one, because then we do one three seven, the exact same people. By definition, everyone who's in will still be in. <laughs> what? One six three. Okay, there we go. One two three. I've got a deuce. Uh, so it's one Come six. On, you don't have to share. Uh, <laughs> dramatic, dramatic. It's supposed to be dramatic. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. That guy does not want me to check, so I will just assert that I have three. I did not get the jackpot, but I have three deuces again. All right. That was the last round. Who's still in? Okay. Feel proud of your spell, smart, sparse set of people. Anyway, uh, what is going on here? That guy already noticed something about my strategy in this game, which is that every time Jamie picked numbers, um, I won $6. And indeed, that is not a coincidence. Let me show you the difference between the distribution with uh, randomly chosen numbers and with my tickets. Um, it's rather different. Although in one important way, it's the same. Like I said, every ticket has the same expected value. So my seven tickets have to have the same expected value as the seven random tickets, namely $6. But my $6 worth of expected value really is the value I expect to get. Indeed, it's the value that I know I'm going to get. Because in fact, I chose my numbers very carefully so that no matter what the jackpot is, I will win exactly $6. Of course, I also got to choose the values of the prizes. And I also chose that to make that come out, too. So that's um. So. Let me make an important point, which is that when we make a bet, it's not only the expected value, the expected return that we care about. Um, we also care about risk. And two bets that have the same expected returns can have very different risk profiles, as you see here. Right? The bet on the left has more risk to it. Of course, that comes with more potential reward, too. Right? You could get a lot more. Um, the bet on the right, my bet, has no risk at all. I know exactly what I'm going to get. Um, most people, not universally, but most people in most situations faced with two bets with the same expected return will choose the one with a lower risk. In many cases, there's very good reasons to do that, by the way. If, if, for instance, you're leveraged, that means you're playing with someone else's money that you've borrowed, that's an extremely good reason to be averse to risk. I mean, again, it's not so much math, it's psychology. If you borrow a lot of money from people and go buy lottery tickets, and then you lose, and then you go back to those same people and say, look at this expected value chart. If you keep on giving me more money, <laughs> in the long run, we're very likely to win. That is true. I mean, mathematically, that is impeccable reasoning. Psychologically, like maybe not so much. So, um, so in a situation like that, you really have an incentive to minimize your risk. I mean, what you might say is that choosing these seven tickets I chose, do I have any like finance majors or anything in? In here, it's what you might call a hedging strategy. You're hedging away your risk. Um, and something like this, I think, is exactly what the players and random strategies were doing. Um, but how do you actually do this? I mean, it's, it's all well and good for me to sort of show you these magic numbers, but how did I come up with these? And they actually come from a rather surprising source. Let me show you a picture of my tickets. OK, why is this a picture of my tickets? First of all, let me just show you what you're looking at. You see, <coughs> you see seven dots here on the screen, labeled with numbers one through seven. And you see um, seven lines. Well, six of them look like lines, and one of them looks like a circle. But I'm just going to call them lines for convenience. 
And if you look at these seven lines, you'll see that each one actually has three points on it, and they exactly correspond to my tickets. Um, there's one, two, three along the bottom. Oh, I have this thing. I might as well use it. Um, there's one, six, seven, which is one of my tickets. There's three, five, seven. And if you care to look at them, you'll see that these are exactly the tickets that I purchased. Um, for the geometry fans, uh, this is a picture of what's called the Fano plane. And um, somehow in the sort of incredibly long version of the story that I tell in the book, I will tell a whole beautiful long story about how this is sort of uh, an example of a finite geometry, a geometry over a finite field, what it has to do with error correcting codes, like what it has to do with artificial languages. I have a lot to say, but I can't say it here. We can talk after. Um, the point I want to make is this. I want to justify my apparently strange choice um, to call this a plane, as Fano did, and my apparently strange choice, choice to call these curves lines when they don't look like lines. You see, in modern mathematics, we try to get out of the habit of asking questions like, what really is a point? What really is a line? We don't really like to think of things that way. We like to say, OK, points are things that behave like points, and lines are things that behave like lines. OK, that sounds like very empty and vacuous and almost like philosophy, so let me try to make it more like math. Um, so how do lines and points act? Well, they act the way that Euclid told us that they act. Right? We know relations between points and lines. And in particular, we know that every two lines determine a unique point where they meet, and every two points determine a unique line that passes through them. And the modern habit of mathematicians, when we talk about a geometry, like a plane geometry, we mean a set of things called points and a set of things called lines which have those properties. And what's cool is that you can see, so I'll just record what I just said on the board, that this set of points and lines has exactly this property, that any two of these lines I choose intersect in a single point, and any two of those points, like let's say 5 and 6, well, the line through them is that one that looks like a circle, 2, 5, 6. By the way, let me pause here. We'll see how well you remember your plane geometry. I said points and lines behave the same way that Euclid told us. But this is actually not quite what Euclid says about points and lines. Anybody see the difference? Exactly. I said, oh, every two lines meet at a point. But those of us who remember high school geometry know that that's not true, right? You can have parallel lines. Not here. So this is an example of what's called a projective geometry in which there's no such thing as parallel lines. And this is much better. I mean, I think, as a modern mathematician, you should consider it a defect that you have sort of different rules. You're like, well, any two distinct points determine a line, but, and any two distinct lines determine a point, unless they're in this other weird class of pairs of lines called parallel lines, which don't. That's disgusting. <laughs> much better to have a nice, clean definition that is exactly symmetric in replacing points and lines. Um, and that's the sort of the, the, the basis of what's called projective geometry. And this is an example of such a geometry in which you have this nice, clean rule for lines and points. OK, well, I've told you this nice story about geometry. What does it have to do with what we're talking about? Here's the miracle. This geometric property, this Euclidean property of these tickets is exactly what makes it have this magic risk hedging property that we talked about. Because let's take one of Jamie's jackpots. Let's take 137. You liked it so much you said it twice. Um, let's do that one. How did I know without checking? Because you were right, I was totally lying. I knew what it was going to be. Um, how did I know without checking that I was going to have three deuces? Well, how did I know I was going to have a ticket containing one and three? Because I just draw the line, and I know I have that, right? Because there exists a unique line joining points one and three. So I knew I was going to have one, and I knew I was going to have only one. Three and seven, same thing. I knew I was going to have, uh, I knew I was going to have a ticket and only one ticket, and the same for one and seven. So without looking at anything, because of this Euclidean property, because every two points are contained in a unique line, I knew I was going to have exactly three deuces. The only way this could go wrong is if Jamie had picked three points that were collinear in the first place. Like what if he had picked one, two, three? What happens then? Then I get the jackpot. And then you can see that I get no other deuces because I'm not going to have some other ticket that contains one and two because there is a unique line through one and two, and it's one, two, three. So I, in that case, I get the jackpot, and I get nothing else. Um, and so that was why I carefully chose the 
jackpot to be exactly three times the, uh, uh, the deuce prize. Um, so, this, so this geometric property exactly dovetails with what you need for it to be a successful strategy for lottery tickets to avoid all risk. Um, every single aspect of the story sort of leads to another whole long, hour-long math story I could tell. In this case, the story of Steiner systems and combinatorial designs, of which this is the first example. Um, yet another story we can talk about after, but I think I won't tell it here. Um, let me just say this. We got so excited about our baby version and what we could say about geometry, I did say at the beginning that the reason we move to a smaller version of the problem that we can think about is that hopefully it gives us some insight into the bigger problem. So you might be hoping that on the next slide is some kind of incredibly intricate hyper triangle with 48 dots <laughs> that will show you. And it's not quite as beautiful as that. But I, I did, as I said, I got kind of obsessed with figuring out what they did. And I sort of like went through a lot of the literature and, and combinatorial designs looking for things which would roughly match the parameters of the Massachusetts Lottery. Um, and I was able to find the following, a paper by R.H.F. Denniston from 1976 um, constructing a Steiner system, um, I think, on 46 points. So you have to sort of do a little bit of hacking to kind of make the cash windfall fit into this because it's 46 instead of 48. Um, but if you use, if you make a set of tickets out of Denniston's design, you get a set of about 230,000 tickets, which all but guarantees that you'll win five out of these five, five of six prizes. So the expected value is the same as any other set of 230,000 tickets, but it essentially eliminates any risk of loss. And actually, there's a, there's a rather wonderful remark in Denniston's paper, wonderful in its interesting outdatedness. I mean, 1975 was not so long ago. Um, but I mean, being that we're sort of all here in this like brand new, beautiful institute of computational mathematics, it's very interesting to see what he writes at the time. Because I mean, how you know how do you check that a set of two hundred thirty thousand tickets has the property he says it has? It's a little bit complicated. So he used okay. Now I'm going to really see who's old in the room. He used some code in Algol. Anybody know Algol? <laughs> okay, that guy. <laughs> Wow, you don't look as old as you actually must be. Um, <laughs> um. Anyway, so he wrote some code to check it, but he felt that he had to kind of make a big point at the beginning of his paper, like, OK, like, yes, I did use computer code to check this, but I promise I certainly didn't use a computer to think of this. <laughs> that would have been completely infra dig for a mathematician at that time. And I think it's quite fascinating, and we sort of see it. I was just at a workshop at ISERM this morning, how much our culture has changed to accept computation as not just something we do after the fact to check, but as an essential part of the way we make mathematical discoveries and investigate hypotheses. I mean, that's, I, I, for a modern mathematician, it's incredibly striking to see something like this, someone feeling like they have to make absolutely clear that no one would think that they used the computer as part of figuring out <laughs> what, they were, what they were trying to do. So, so now we really are at the end of the story. Um, as, as I think this seems to me like a good answer to that second question. Why would they choose the tickets by hand? Why do all that extra work? Um, I think it's precisely to make some kind of combinatorial design or something like that in order to hedge away their risk. Now, I did manage to make contact with these guys, but I could not get them to confirm that they actually did this. Um, but I think if they didn't, they should have. <laughs> so I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you guys so much. Um, A preparatory question first. They had to, if they only won even the small jackpots, they had to split if other people picked the same numbers as they did? Uh, yes. So, so that, that's why the expected value went down a so lot. So I would suggest that they also picked numbers that are higher than 30 on purpose 
because people tend to pick lottery tickets that have numbers in months because it's their birthday, et cetera, so they were less likely to conflict with other people who pick the right tickets. So on the one hand, that's true. On the other hand, by the time this was in full swing, the number of people who were, I mean, the number of tickets being bought by people who would, would do that, like normal people, was like so small relative to, <laughs> that, it all, that it almost didn't matter. But that's good advice for like general, uh, for general lottery playing, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I hope you can hear me. What's the, the risk or the variance of just randomly picking tickets and not being clever about it? Like, is it much riskier? It's, it's somewhat riskier, but it's not as dramatic a difference as in the small example I showed. Because when you're buying 230,000 instead of seven, even if you buy randomly, like a lot of the risk goes away. So I don't, I don't quite, I did compute this while I was writing this chapter of the book, and I don't remember quite the numbers, but I think there was, there wasn't a huge chance of getting much less, but maybe there was sort of like a 20, 25% chance or something like that. So they were hedging away something that mattered, but it wasn't dramatic the way it was in the, in the toy example. I mean, it's an interesting question of whether, whether, whether that was worth the work or not is an interesting question. Um, did you have a question in the back? I see a hand wave. Yeah. You did not? OK, everybody, that guy does not have a question. Um, OK. I have one. Uh, do they, was this their full-time job? Or did they, I mean, you said that they have a job. Was this their full-time job? Um, I, I think it was for like the two main people, the people who were sort of in charge. Actually, OK, I'll tell a story that I cannot verify, so I would not put it in the book because I can't, I mean, I heard it from the guy's mom. Um, <laughs> which is not a good enough source. But what I have been told is that at least one person, there was at least one person who did not have to fill out any tickets by hand and did not have to wait in line at the convenience store like buying like 20, 30,000 tickets at a time. There was one person involved who, I am told, I'm not claiming this is fact, um, who all they did was set up this risk minimization scheme. And what they told uh, the main two guys, whose names were Harvey and Liu, um, he said, I'm going to tell you which tickets to pick in exchange for 7% off the top, and I don't have to do any more work. <laughs> and so for that guy, it was not his full-time job. Uh, he's a math professor now. Um, but he collected sort of a handsome amount of money just for sort of one day of setting up this combinatorial design, or so I presume that's what he did. Um, so that, that's, that's what I know about. I actually even only know, I only know the names of the two people who are in the report. So actually I know there were other people because it's reported, but I don't know who they were. Yeah? Did they consider buying a 7-Eleven or Cumberland Farm so that they might <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, did they consider buying their own convenience store? I have um, I have one good story about this, actually. So I feel like I tell this story in a way that kind of privileges the MIT kids. Oh, they were so good at math. They were so awesome. I will say this. For Jerry Selby, um, while he did not buy a convenience store, what he did do, OK, so I don't know if you guys know this, but the store gets a cut too. Like if you win a big lottery prize at a store, the store gets 3% of the winning. That's to motivate stores to like do a good job selling lots of lottery tickets. So um, Jerry Selby, who was going to his favorite convenience store in Williamstown, uh, very quickly sort of said to them, you know, 3% seems a little high to me. Why don't we split that 3% for everything I win, and you get 1.5%, and I get another 1.5%. And if you don't like it, there's plenty of other convenience stores in Williamstown. <laughs> <laughs> so he may not have known that much math, but he was like, no fool. <laughs> and I don't think the MIT kids thought of that. That's street. That's good stuff. Um, so that I put in the book because Selby himself told me that he did that in writing. I don't know if it's legal or not, but he did tell me, so I felt I was, like, allowed, to, I was allowed to say it. Yes. Don't like humans calculate risk greater than rewards, or they're more likely to take something with a greater reward but less risk? Yeah, so don't humans tend to like calculate risk greater than reward? In other words, yes, I think most people are what is called risk averse. Um, and so I think that's why the, the MIT kids were motivated to, um, to do all this extra work in order to have less risk with the same amount, with the same amount of reward. What's funny is that this kind of behavior is what a classical 
economist would call irrational, whereas I would just call it normal. <laughs> um, but in sort of technical economic terms, it's irrational behavior if you have the same uh, amount of reward. Uh, yeah. So might they also have just been picking numbers in a way that allowed them to figure out which ones were the winners later more rapidly? Sort them out. So uh, pick numbers that all start with one, for example. So if there's no one in the answer, they're all in that box. Because otherwise, it's a very tedious process after you win. But there are thousands of tickets to figure out which ones are winners. <laughs> that, that is possible. So I don't actually know that much about their process of sifting winners from losers. At least the impression I had is that that was not like a major, major part of their workflow, but, um, but, that, but that could be too. So why did, they, why did Massachusetts shut it down? Apparently it was good for everybody, right? Oh, because once that Globe story came out, I think if that Globe story had not come out, they would not have shut it down. But once somehow they were in the newspaper as presented as, oh, the mass lottery got scammed by these groups of people, then sort of they, for PR reasons, they had to close down the game. An interesting question, by the way, so here's something I do not know, and if I were like a real reporter instead of a mathematician and a fake reporter, I think I would have been able to figure this out. Um, I did not know whether Massachusetts knew what had happened in Michigan. Like, did they know that Michigan's game had been taken over by Jerry Selby and that they had shut it down, or did they just not check. Um, I did talk to the Michigan Lottery Office to ask if that was why they shut their game down. And the Michigan Lottery official asserted that they had no idea that any such thing was taking place in Michigan, which is a total lie. But, um, <laughs> but that was as far as I got. I mean, I, I like, if there's any reporters in the audience, you can tell me what I should have said or done to like get through this like wall of lottery PR, but I could not do it. <laughs> Yeah, Joe. I didn't find any. Um, I didn't find any coverage of this uh, from from Michigan at all. It just kind of came and went. Right. So it wasn't because of some massive expose in Michigan, as far as I could see, that they shut it down. Yeah, in the back. What other phenomena have this uh, have this ability to try many things and get close? So. It, so in cryptography, you can guess the key, but if you're close to the key and, go, and not exact, it doesn't, it doesn't work. But uh, in, in Las Vegas, can you get close? Or are there other phenomena in life where, where getting <coughs> close helps and you can do things any time? You mean getting close in the sense that getting an approximate jackpot wins you money? Is that the sense in which you mean? Um, <coughs> <coughs> I, I think probably more games of chance are like that than not, right? So like probably many of you, probably many of you guys like have retirement accounts that are like heavily invested in equities. That's like a very popular gambling mechanism that <laughs> people undertake. And you sort of maybe if you're the kind of person who um, who likes to kind of pick and choose your stocks and buy things and sell things, then in some sense you're sort of making some set of predictions. And if you are, you don't have to get everything exactly right if you're like pretty close. Um, then, then you'll do well. So I think, I, I actually think, yeah, I think more chance games are like that than not. Yeah? Does any other state have this lottery now? <laughs> um, yeah, is any other state currently running a roll down lottery? I do check from time to time, I'm not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> um, as far as I know, there are other states that have a thing called a roll down, but it doesn't operate anywhere near as generously as, as this. So I do occasionally check and I have not seen anyone adopt. Um, but yeah, I mean, let me put it this way. I would not, I mean, a state lottery official who decided to do this might be making a good choice. I mean, it was a pretty good deal for Massachusetts. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't count that as impossible, but as far as I know, no. But would I tell you? That's the question. <laughs> um, um, Yep. Whatever became of their company, what are they up to now? Ah, oh, do you want to guess? This is a good one. What are, okay, what are, these, what are these two guys doing now? Who wants to guess? Probably quant stuff on Wall Street. That was a good guess, but no. <laughs> Working for the lottery. <laughs> no, no, that would be interesting. No, they're startup dudes in Silicon Valley, of course. They're like, they, they decided to like play an even bigger gamble. So they're startup, <laughs> they're, they're startup guys, and they have an, what is their app called? I think it's called Quickly Chat. I mean, it's some kind of, it's some kind of thing where somehow, if you work in an office, people can like open a chat window on your screen like against your will or something. It sounds horrible. Um, 
but, but apparently a lot of people invested in it, so you see why I'm not in Silicon Valley. Um, um. Well, thank you so much, Thanks, everybody.